Hi, everyone. Loud and clear? OK. My name is Dennis. Um, I took the assignment a little bit differently, but um, that's OK. I'll, I'll wing it. Um, I'm one of the still one of the founders of Buffalo and the current CEO of Buffalo. Um, but that's going to change the last part. Eh? In January, we're going to assign uh, a new uh, person to that task because we are in the phase that the company is scaling and I'm more of an innovator. So put me in the first phase and I'll be fine. Put me in the scaling phase and I'll be out of energy. I'm not out of energy today, so, that, but I'm drinking Nalu. <laughs> I'll put it away. Um, I'm going to start a little bit uh, about what, what is Buffel. Um, if you want to see the slides, uh, this beautiful slides. So what we do, we, um, we originate from um, product design and development and innovation. And that's what I studied way too long. Uh, and I realized that innovation itself is, is cool and is a very interesting branch to be working in, but it's very difficult to uh, put it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in action. It's very hard to know what you should be doing the next day. And why is that? Because we make a lot of decisions and those decisions are often based on gut feeling, are often based on experience, are often based on what we've been doing all our lives. And that's where the problem came in of market research. I want to ask when I was still working for a uh, small SME, I wanted to ask like 100 customers, what is your opinion on a certain topic? And that's where it all originated. Uh, market research is pretty slow as we knew it traditionally. And the clock speed of innovation or the clock speed of creative process are much faster than the clock speed of validation. So we were creating something new. We had five concepts. What do we do with it? Oh, we have to validate it with the markets. Six weeks later, we get an answer. Six weeks later, we get an interpretation and insights, and then we have to start over again. Long story short, we created a technology to be able to question uh, consumers and to make decisions as fast as possible. And that we do with an application. We ask people questions, they give us answers, they get rewarded mm -hmm. for it, typical. But we placed it all in a methodology to um, learn corporates, our main clients and innovation departments, what you should decide on a day-to-day -day basis and how you can make decisions much faster. To give you an idea, a typical innovation process for a corporate like Proximus or Nestle or uh, Unilever, it takes about one year and one year and a half, and we do it in six weeks. So we can validate a complete innovation process in six weeks, which is much faster. Why am I telling you this? Because um, we scaled a bit and in 2020, of course, Corona hit. And then what we are talking about is how are you going to manage that? And one of the things we realized is before Corona hit, we were growing our teams and we had very bad communication lines. So we were with three founders and we were all responsible for like a few departments and it was becoming very difficult to make decisions on a daily basis. And we were becoming the bottleneck of our own company. And that was a problem. So we created departments and we created teams and we created team leads and a management team and everything you need to do to make a stable foundation to grow your company to make it scalable corona hit thank god we were prepared otherwise we would have been dead but uh, we thought we were so good prepared everybody has their department and their team lead and uh, communication lines were very clear and we had okrs and kpis and everything you need and um during corona we realized that that was not working so to explain you why that was not working, I'm going to give you actually our failures because I'm not going to boast about the things that we're doing good. I'm going to talk about the things that we failed at. So maybe you can learn something from it and may, do not make the same mistakes. But to explain a bit better where it all originates from, wrong slide, um, we go to the... I mean, market research, so it's based on market research and the sociology and, and psychology and whatever. Um, and it's called the me, myself and I. Based from sociology, there are three types of myself or three types of I. And to explain them a bit better, as because I will tell you why we failed in this, is that we start always with the incognito person. And the incognito person, yeah, incognito browser for those of you, is you are actually uh, unknown it's the yourself that you're not talking about is the one that you keep secret it's the one that nobody knows about often you don't even know yourself in a very good way there you do not know what drives you you don't know what gives you energy and you have to think about it 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 comes natural to not think about this because the other two are much more important due to society 
the me myself or I. The other one is the mask, the clown. Why is that? Is that it's how we present ourselves to the world. It's the mask we put on. It's Instagram. It's Facebook. It's how we want to be perceived. It's what we think the society thinks is important. And the last one is the painting. It's like the third person viewer is going to sketch a painting of you. And he's going to say, well, I see when I look at Dennis, I see this kind of person. And there you have a very strange dynamic going on. Because who the hell are you talking to if you're doing market research? It's very difficult. And the challenge of market researchers is to talk to this person, but to market things here. And that's a very, that's a very difficult dynamic that you have going on. Now, why am I telling you this when it's about uh, Corona and how we managed Corona? Um, is because we made the mistake that we knew the people that were working for us. So we would, back in 2020, we were with uh, a total of 15 FTEs in total. And they were all split up in departments. But we made the mistake of labeling people. And we thought we have introverts and extroverts. We thought we have ITers and we have um, people that do the uh, administration and legal. And we have people that do the sales. So there you have a big different kind of people. And the ITers, we thought they are introverts. And the people that are managing our community and doing HR, they are very extroverts. So we have two kinds of boxes we put people into. And then we thought we're going to have to keep everybody together. We're going to have to do team building, but online. So we did the craziest things um, that weren't all successful, but like escape games and things like that. And then we realized, well, this is very good for the extroverted people. But that was not true. We knew that, well, we realized that that wasn't always working. And the boxes that we defined here or here were not actually working. Why? Because there's no such thing as an extrovert person or an introvert person. You have a very subset of variables that are important and that, that you do not always know about yourself. So we had a classic example is we had a, a gin tasting, for example. Everybody was there and we had a very big meeting. Uh, and we had to taste the gin after gin and then explain what we liked about it. And we thought, well, this is good for the extroverted people because we can talk about it and this and that. But that was not true because what's typical in, an, uh, yeah, in a video call is you can talk one at a time. So you had to, I have to go, then you can go, and then you can talk about the gin, the same gin that I drank. What do you taste in it? Ooh, a little bit of nuts. No, that doesn't work. And we realized it was energy draining for those people. On the other side, though, those introvert people, some of them really liked it because they had the, the sense that they were all together again, that they could talk to other people in other departments, but they didn't have to mingle. They didn't have to talk. They could just drink gin and get tipsy. And <laughs> that was amazing for them. And then we started thinking, why doesn't the box system work? Why cannot, why can't we place every employee in a certain box? Well, it's clear because humans are very difficult to put in boxes. But it's the way that we, as a painter, we try to make sense of the world. You get the insights test with the blue and the yellow and the green people. And you get, uh, what is it, uh, the 16 personalities. And you get the uh, uh, Enneagram test. And what it actually is, why do we like the mask? Is because we want to make sense of who we are. And we want to present ourselves in a certain way. And the painters, this is where the issue starts. This is where, oh, you think I'm that, but I'm not like this. I, I don't like this, what you're thinking. And we organized based on this instead of this. And that was the big difficulty where we were facing. So as a market research firm, even for us, it was crazy difficult to define what could we do. So we hosted a lot of surveys, of course, and we did a lot of interviews. And we were asking, how can we improve the way that we are connecting with each other? And how can we make sure we are not working in silos and that we do not diverge from each other. And it was a very bewildering experience because we had a lot of talks and we over engineered it, I know, but we, uh, we organized micro uh, gatherings, for example, and we gave everyone a budget of 25 euros per month and you can do whatever you want because we were all out of ideas. And then we started logging what the people were doing. And that was pretty interesting to see because somehow the people that we put in a certain box were not doing the things that they should have been doing by design. 
And then we asked him about this. Why is this? Well, because I like this kind of hobbies. And why do you like this kind of hobbies? Well, it gives me energy on this and this and this field. And then we started realizing, well, maybe we should work with those fields and those energy drivers and the things that they come up with themselves. And we saw those groups forming that were very natural to them because you match with some people naturally. And then you have to make a decision as a, an employer to say, well, we have to break those groups up again. But how do you do that? How do you not only let the people in Antwerp or in Ghent match and get together in a micro gathering, but how can you make sure that Antwerp and Ghent get together as well? How do you convince them to do that? And then we used those drivers, those energy drivers. And we said, well, you like, for example, a lot of sports, but why do you like sports? Because you get a, a good feeling about it or is it because you are, want to be healthy? this one or is it because you want to get tired in the evening and sleep better and that's actually this one but you do not know and then we made like anonymous profiles of everyone and only the people that were matched got the invitation and said well we can go there we can go there we can go there then the other failure came and uh, well it's not gdpr because we're compliant of course but um suddenly they were labeled and it was a big problem because then this is not the mask that they're used to, but it's based on this. So we went very deep within every person and their personality, and we extracted what their energy givers were, but it didn't match with the mask that they were going to present themselves to the world. And then we gave up, basically. Uh, we stopped organizing things, and we just said, well, let it go. Just let them organize themselves. And that is the best decision we took. Because everything else just came naturally because we were like well we do not know as an employer and we can organize everything we want and we can make sure that people come back to the office after corona and things like that but in the end the biggest decision that we made was we showed our own vulnerability as an employer and we showed them like this is very complex to us and we can organize whatever we want we can throw money at it but in the end the people decide where the energy comes from and who they want to connect with and it is very important to come back to the office and that is maybe the final thing how we handle corona and the hybrid working now is we have a fixed day that some teams meet on the same day and we have a mixed day where you do not know who you're going to meet so we force a bit the natural connection that people have and that is working pretty good right now so we have two days in the week that we meet at the office and three days in the week that we don't um, but it's you, you feel free if you come to the office, yes or no. So we are not limiting people at the office. Um, and the thing that um, the energy that is now at the office is when you come or what the main reason that people come to the office is, is not to work anymore. You, you work less efficiently, but you connect more because you give that freedom. And we make sure that the teams that come to the office are not sitting in a meeting room all day they do hard work or focus work. So in a six hour day or an eight hour day, maybe you work four hours focus time and the rest is connecting. But that kind of connecting is enough for us right now. So we do the, yeah, the, the engagement surveys, of course, which is this a little bit and this a little bit. And those engagement surveys, they have been going up steadily and we like the way that it's going right now. And it all started by admitting that you do not know the answer. And that created a context or, or an atmosphere that was a co-creation atmosphere. Like we all want this to work, but we're not finding the solution of, or we didn't find the correct way, the correct formula, but we need everyone's help. And right now we feel that it's growing organically, which is a much better way of working than forcing it as an employer. There you go. That's it. I'm um, Dennis. That